Welcome back to D&D Beyond, and I am very excited for today's show because friend of the channel, friend to all in D&D, uh, beloved voice actor, performer, creator, TTRPG lover, Mark Mir is here. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you for having me. We last had you here with your Black Dice Society crew last year talking about building mm. the perfect Ravenloft party. Uh, something that uh, I know you have a long history and and love of, um, mm. and we will not be doing any spoilers for that show at this time, although you should all mm. be watching. Um, but uh, before we get into what we are going to talk about today, a few quick notes for folks tuning in. Right now, you can catch three different books on pre-order on D&D Beyond. You can grab your journeys through the Radiant Citadel Anthology of Adventures. Your Morden Cana presents Monsters of the Multiverse, which draws ever closer. Uh, and of course, you could, if you want, you could pre-order some Spelljammer Adventures in Space. Because we just get all the good things right now. There's also brand new sub perks. If you are a D&D &D Beyond subscriber, uh, you have some cool new portrait frames that are space themed available for the month of May. Uh, and most exciting for me personally of all, it's almost Jasper's Game Week. We are once again teaming up with Jasper's Game Day, the organization that helps support mental health and suicide prevention, to put on a stream week extravaganza here on D&D Beyond, uh, which includes a bunch of tables with some of your and my favorite players, including, oh, one, DM Mark Meir on Tuesday, May 10th Me. at uh, 1230 mm -hmm. Pacific with Trisha Hirschberger, Eric Campbell, Gina DeVivo, and KP of KP11 Studios. That is correct. I'm glad you had all that information at your fingertips. What can you, can you tease anything for us about what your game is going to be like when people tune in next week and maybe even donate to hmm. affect it? Oh, yes. Well, I am playing uh, a game that uh, I first crafted this particular little adventure. It was part of my campaign at D&D in a Castle back in 2019, and I have lifted out part of it, and we're going to uh, play that. It is called The Host. Mm -hmm. That, that's a uh, word that has many meanings in Dungeons and Dragons, yes. It sure does. Uh, folks, you do not want to miss any Mark Mir game, uh, but I can confirm an amazing DM, always a wonderful time. Uh, and please make sure you are, you're making your watch party plans for Jasper's Game Week coming up. But today, the reason I have uh, finagled you into coming to join us on stream is that I would love to take a tour of one of your character sheets. Do one of our character mm -hmm. sheet tours to see sort of how you mm -hmm. put things together, which were the big choices and how it all adds up to create a character. And today you have very kindly offered us a look at a level 20 version of Bayloth Baratil. Yes, Can you tell us a Bayloth brief history? Baratil. Who is Bayloth? Bayloth Baratil, a.k.a. Bayloth the Entertainer, is the proprietor of The Black Pits, the most gruesome gladiatorial combat that the Underdark has to offer. Now, Bayloth first appeared in the Baldur's Gate Enhanced Editions in the minigame called The Black Pits, uh, and he, of course, was the main villain. Uh, he also, spoilers for a game that came out quite a while ago, uh, it was possible to actually get Bayloth in your party because uh, over the course of the adventure, once you defeated him, he had access to many wish spells and he wished that he, uh, in the event of his death, he would be resurrected and restored. Uh, he didn't phrase the wish quite perfectly and uh, the jinn in question had reason to not necessarily look on him favorably so he gets resurrected at the same level as the rest of the party so he is like an ultra powerful uh spellcaster who then suddenly gets chopped down to whatever level your player character has to be at, have, is at at the time uh so he wasn't very happy about that uh and he went on to have uh further life because in addition to like the fan art and and things like that that came in i played bayloth uh of course having been hired to voice him in this game uh i went on to play him in rpg games like just the uh, actual table uh top stuff so at dungeons and dragons uh live D, &D live i think in 2019 i played him in a very high level adventure uh that was dm'd by b dave walters uh which ended with Bayloth taking possession of the Tarrasque, which understandably became the Black Pit star attraction. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, he's he's a very fun character to play. Uh, when I was first hired to play him, I sort of approached him as a combination of, uh, well, certainly there's notes of Mark Hamill's Joker in there 
uh, in his initial uh, interpretation. Also, uh, Mojo and Arcade from the X-Men, because they, they share a similar MO in that they kidnap adventurers and then have them play in essentially what's sort of a very violent game show. Uh, or, you know, there's there's parallels to Vince McMahon as well, because he's, you know, essentially running uh, the fantasy equivalent of the WWE, and, uh, which is all real, of course. And he, yeah, he's, uh, he's a very, very fun villain, and he's actually found himself in sort of a, a more cooperative role when we play RPGs, because I've certainly used him as an NPC in some of my campaigns, and he's, he's great then, but he's a little more, he's more of a team player when he's sitting at the table in things like Idol Champions Presents, of course, and he's had many adventures uh, on that show. Uh, he also recently uh, became Champion of the Realm on uh, Realmsmith TV's uh, PvP D&D show, uh, facing some very stiff competition, uh, so with some great players, but uh, Bayloth managed to uh, emerge triumphant, and of course, he hasn't shut up about it since. Well, could you give us just a taste of like uh, reproduce a, a victory speech or a, a welcome from Bayloth? Oh, yes, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Black Pits, the finest martial magnificence you will see above or underground. I wasn't uh, warmed up, really, but yes, yeah, you get the you get the general gist of Bayloth. So, uh, as as mentioned, he's had uh, a number of, uh, I guess, uh, feathers in his cap uh, since his, in his career as an RPG character. Capturing the Trask, of course, was one. Uh, he also, in one of the more recent Idol Champions presents, uh, he managed to get the killing blow on Tiamat uh, with uh, the Wand of Orcus, no less, which he also came into possession of. And uh, now some would say that Tiamat had already surrendered uh, at that point, thanks to a very, very touching scene with Hope's character. But uh, as far as Bailoth is concerned, he is the slayer of, of Tiamat. And also Halister Blackcloak, but we found out later that was actually just a wizard named Alabaster, uh, no, Alabaster Bootyclap. That was his name. <laughs> so good along times, good and times over at, at uh, Idol Champions Presents. Many wonderful stories uh, under his belt, uh, but this particular version that you've shared us about shared with us. Can you tell me a little bit about building Bayloth at level twenty? Um, obviously, he has mm -hmm. existed since before our current rule set was in place. Um, so, how did you approach building this max level version of Bayloth? Okay, now there are a few. Uh, I should say. Special points about this particular build. First of all, uh, this is actually the initial stats were made with point by, as opposed to the assigned stats which Bayloth usually has. His his assigned stats because he was a villain in in a second edition game, uh, or at least a game using second edition rules, which the uh, Baldur's Gate enhanced editions were. Uh, yeah, he had he had phenomenal stats, uh, including I believe it was a nineteen intelligence. Uh, when I ported him over as a 5th edition character, of course, certain changes had to be made. Sorcerers used to be powered by intelligence as opposed to charisma, so we flipped his uh, charisma and intelligence stats. They were both good. It was 19 intelligence and 16 charisma, I think, and then so we flipped those. Uh, obviously, with these, he's not quite up to the level of his stats that he was before. You can see that 22 charisma, that's, of course... The, the Wand of Orcus is uh, providing some uh, some enhancement there. And uh, we'll he actually does have... We'll circle back around to that one, but it's, you can see it in the inventory. By the way, this link is running from chat, mm -hmm. and it's in the description if you're watching this on YouTube so that you can click around and uh, find all of these good things. Please, please continue. Mm -hmm. So uh, this, this build was uh, created, as I mentioned, for Idol Champions Presents, and specifically for the Trials of Mount Tiamat. So we knew we were going up against... Tiamat, and I sort of I took that into consideration when building Bayloth. Uh, he's actually he's got quite a decent Constitution store, and I I beef that up, of course, with tough uh, because hit points were really important uh, in this particular game. Uh, we were taking a lot of damage, and B Day was not giving us rests, uh, which of course enhanced the drama of the whole thing. But yeah, hit points became very very important. Uh, and let's see, what else can we talk about in the, oh, uh, when I was porting him over, of course, uh, sorcerers didn't necessarily have to have, say, the bloodlines or the source of their sorcerer's power in previous editions. When I mm -hmm. created Bayloth for the first time in fifth edition, I figured, sh uh, Shadow Sorcerer probably fit him best 
if there had been a, a canon demonic bloodline sorcerer, I might have gone with that for him instead. But uh, I think, yeah, Shadow Sorcerer does fit him. And uh, subsequently, certain Shadow Sorcerer powers like the Hound of Ill Omen, that became very much part of his character with Marmadark, who is his Hound of uh, Ill Omen, and who, who proved very, very important in his recent uh, Champions of the Realms battles. But let's see here. Is there anything specifically you want to talk about? You talk about collection of feats or... Yes. Uh, so let's see. We've talked about how you you ended up... Sorcerer was sort of baked in from the beginning, but in choosing the subclass, you mm -hmm. leaned into Shadow Magic, both for its theme and for some of these features, like we can see here, the sixth level Hound of Ill Omen. Uh, you mm -hmm. gain the ability to call forth a howling creature of darkness to harass your foes, uh, which is very exciting. Um, it when is. You were... And I will say... <laughs> I will say that at this particular level, Marmadark is less of a factor than at lower levels. He's very, very much uh, part of uh, Baylot's usual tactics. But at this level, Marmadark essentially has direwolf stats. So he's used mostly for the very nice feature of Hound of Ill Omen, which is if he's adjacent to a target of your spells, they have disadvantage on their saving throws. Uh, so yeah, he's he tends to be summoned solely for that and not so much for his attack routine of you know, a bite, which, you know, when you're, when you're operating at this level, he's probably not going to hit the AC of whatever you're up against. Fair enough. Uh, so, you, you know, for the, the moral support and the company and keep mm -hmm. crucially the disadvantage. Um, so what about, uh, we talked why, why shadow sorcerer, were there any sort of mm -hmm. key meta magic, um, choices that you, that helped make him feel more like Bela? Uh, definitely the empowered and twinned because Bayloth has always been about the big flashy destructive magic and just overwhelming, mm -hmm. uh, overwhelming, uh, evocation. Uh, so yeah, definitely those, those all help in massively increase the, uh, the amount of damage that you can deal, especially like twin spell and things like that. But also, even though subtlety is not necessarily something you would associate with Bayloth, uh, certainly not in his self-promotion, but... Subtle spell is very handy for avoiding things like counter spell, which Baylot likes to do. Yeah. So yeah, subtle spell important. Also, uh, again, at this at this particular level, uh, illusion magic is not necessarily going to be as much of a factor because a lot of the things that you're going up against will have true sight uh, or can similarly see pierce illusions quite easily. But at lower levels, yeah, the uh, the major image spell is definitely part of Baylot's repertoire. Uh, there was a great uh, illusion that I pulled off in, uh, it was in Idol Champions Presents, uh, of a, a bunch of red pandas in tuxedos and top hats riding into the scene on unicycles uh, and waving around strings of hot dogs uh, to confuse some wild dogs. Uh, that worked out very well. It, it led to the red panda skins in uh, <laughs> in that particular Which game. So, yeah. Folks should look up because they are very cute. Uh, so just to, mm -hmm. as a quick, for folks who might not be familiar, might be building a sorcerer at home right now, those metamagic we referred to are, of course, one of the things that make the sorcerer class unique and so much fun. Subtle spell is going to let you spend a sorcery point to cast a spell without a somatic or a verbal component, um, which means under the radar. Uh, empowered spell is going to let you re-roll dice for bigger damage. Heightened spell is going to let you uh, give a target some disadvantage on its first saving throw. Um, and twin spell is going to let you duo a spell essentially from one victim to two, uh, which is going mm -hmm. to help you to hand out that big splashy damage. And you started to walk us through some of the key spell choices um, for high level mm -hmm. Bayloth, the, the lower level magic illusion spells. And then what are, what are the big guns? What are the big go to the big guns? Hand now down in this some damage. I, I did mention the flashy destructive spells, uh, and you don't get much more destructive or flashy than Meteor Swarm, which is the, what this particular build of Baloth has. Uh, I should mention that when I tend to use Baloth as a very high-level NPC or, or an antagonist even in my games, uh, he will tend to have Wish as his ninth-level spell. And uh, yeah, he's, a, he's sort of been established as having used quite a bit of wish magic, usually without any regard to the consequences. Uh, he also, of course, has at his disposal uh, Najim, a jinn noble, who also can cast wish. So yeah, the Black, the black Pits, there's a lot of nested wish spells uh, surrounding the Black Pits itself, which explains how they're able to keep something like the Tarask in check, even if briefly. Uh, but for this one, uh, again, for this particular camp, I didn't want... 
poor B Dave to have to deal with like me making wishes constantly because that's that can really really mess things up and it was a streamed game and everything so it's like eh, let's keep things simple meteor swarm just a lot of bludgeoning and fire damage fantastic and, uh, uh, let's see some of my other high level choices were essentially just influenced by what Baloth tended to use in his original incarnation because again uh when he was uh the villain of the black pits uh he uh, his spell list included power word stun, so I made sure to include that on there. Chain lightning, he likes that. Disintegrate. Uh, and, you know, disintegrate's just a good spell, let's face it. As long as they fail their saving throw. And if you've got a Hound of Ill Omen, plus a redundancy build in for heightened magic, uh, people are often going to be rolling a disadvantage when encountering. Uh, excellent backup to work together to get those mm -hmm. uh, effects across. Let's see. We also, in, in building Bayloth, I notice, uh, because this is the, the public-facing thing, I, I can't overtly click on it, but I notice if I go over here to your tools, you have been granted a disguise kit by your background entertainer. I Yes, ba Bayloth is known as... Conclusion? He is Bayloth the entertainer, after all. So when, I, when it came to background, it's like, yes. Though his entertaining skills, uh, he's largely an MC. He's, he's again, he's an announcer. He's a carnival barker extraordinaire, essentially. So that's what I use his performance skills for. And I believe I gave him, what's his performance? Yeah, his, he's got a plus 12 on his performance. Uh, he but again, sure he, it's, it's, it's not like he's going to sing you a song. He's probably just going to hype up the latest match that's uh, in the Black Pits. And so, yeah, that's what he'd be using that performance skill for, I would say, largely. Uh, what is what is his other? So oh yeah, your, so his best six skills. From your charisma bonus and your uh, six from your proficiency, making up that twelve for, for performance. Mm -hmm. I think there were at least some builds of him. I've actually given him like expertise in performance, or uh, I think deception was another one. But yes, his his top skills are deception comes in handy when negotiating contracts. Uh, intimidation also comes in handy when negotiating contracts, and uh, and his performance. Those are. Those are the things that he's particularly good at. Mm -hmm. So this, of course, the 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 switch from sor to sorcerers using charisma works in very much in favor of a themed uh, character like this, um, of mm -hmm. course. Now, uh, how do the things on this sheet feed back into your play and your performance choices? Things like, I suppose, a, a faithful hound came a little bit out of those mechanics. Oh, yeah, most definitely, because uh, Bayloth, I mean, Bayloth's always surrounded by something of a posse. He's got an entourage with him almost constantly. And this this sort of adds to that because, you know, I'm I'm if I'm playing in a streaming game or, or a table game, I'm probably not going to have access to I'll have the I'll have Najim with me because he's a jinn and he's got his ring. But, uh, you know, Bayloth also is used to having backup in the form of his buddy, who's a Rakshasa, El Elan Garak. And Glural, who is a beholder that's been bound to him through a wish spell. And, of course, all of his staff at the Black Pits and whatnot. So being able to at least have Najim and Marmadark with him, and, you know, then then he feels... And, and of course, you can summon a fiend, too, for company. Uh, and uh, then, it, then it feels like he's got his keeps with him. Uh, we do have some questions uh, coming in from chat already. Dennis Hap asked, what is your use of the creatures listed in extras? And it sounds like you're sort of running us through... They're kind of a retinue. Uh, of uh, of associates um that you've got yes, listed these in the are, tab here yes and uh, of course none of these came into play in this particular uh build of bailoth but i realized they're still on there because i copied him uh over and uh, and then rebuilt him uh according to the specifications of this game but i but uh, yeah basically all of those are basically folks that bailoth tends to hang out uh although yeah the jinn is not actually Najim is quite a bit more powerful than that uh, generic jinn because he's a jinn noble. So, uh, but these, yeah, these tend to be, this would be sort of the main employees at the Black Pits. And, oh, I, I, I guess I should this mention is the your phone book, really. Yes, exactly. Yeah, it's his, it's his roll of dice. He's an old fashioned guy. Uh, so, yeah, the Dragloth, that's worth mentioning because that was not part of Bayloth's original lore, but it is something that I added in a game that was sort of set at the Black Pits and a little more fleshed out. The Dragloth uh, is uh, It Baratil, uh, and uh, Bayloth refers to him as Cousin It 
because he is, in fact, his cousin. Uh, Dregoloth are half drow and half, I believe, Glazebru, uh, one of the, what used to be called a type three demon. Uh, and uh, so on the drow side, they are related. Uh, he is the son of Baloth's aunt, who is a high priest of Lol. Uh, Baloth has, of course, he's, he's turned his back on uh, the religion he was raised with, which was Lol worship. He's sort of, he's much more of a free agent, though he has been known to hang out with Drazi. Amazing. Uh, so we've talked through some of the spell selection, um, some of the various features and traits that you've picked up and opted into for your meta magic. Your inventory has some interesting things in it. Uh, some of these might just be that they came up in the course of game, but others might be basic to the build. Is there are there one or two things that jump out as important from the the stash of Baloth? Uh, yes. So uh, the robe of the Archmagi, that is something that Baloth canonically has. He's uh, He's got his robe of the Archmagi, black robes, obviously, because he is chaotic evil. And uh, he's had those, yeah, since since the early uh, Beam Dog games. And uh, the so Ring of Jin summoning, of armor course. Armor class is 15 plus your dex modifier if you aren't wearing armor for this, which helps a lot. You have advantage on saving throws against spells and other magical effects. And your spell save DC and spell attack bonus each increase by two. So this is a wondrous item, yes. but if you can get your hands on one, I would say recommend it. <laughs> oh, yes. Very, very good item. I'm glad that that's canonically part of Baylot. Uh, and it does give, as you mentioned, uh, quite a number of advantages to a spellcaster. Uh, the, uh, let's see... The others, uh, his staff of defense, he's all often seen with a skull-like staff, and depending on various builds, that staff has been everything from a staff of power to a staff of the Magi to, in the earlier, uh, lower-powered Baloth builds, it's usually a staff of defense. He, uh, it was in the course of this particular game that Baloth was actually, well, literally handed the staff of Orcus. He didn't have to work for it. He was handed the staff of Orcus, Orcus by the Raven Queen, after uh, Shaka, uh, Sharif Jackson's character, who has a long, long-standing relationship with the Raven Queen, was offered it and very nobly refused the, this this artifact of unholy power, the Wand of Orcus, even though it could have really helped. He he nobly turned it down, and Baloth essentially stepped in and went, "Well, if he doesn't want it," and and the Raven Queen went for it. Uh, maybe being a shadow sorcerer helps, uh, but you know, of, of course he. There was no end of sucking up that, he, that Baloth did, but uh, for her own reasons, the Raven Queen handed over the Wand of Orcus to Baloth. And in our most recent uh, trip to the Shadowfell, uh, his ownership over it uh, was somewhat cemented even further. In fact, he's he's taken to calling it the Wand of Baloth. Uh, and uh, Orcus himself reclaimed the wand. Baloth was, of course, highly upset and managed to... There was, a, there was a lot of very high-level play and deities and stuff involved. The goddess Mask actually uh, agreed to steal it back from ba for Baloth. And when Mask steals things, they tend to stay stolen. So for, for right now, for who knows how long, Baloth is still the current wielder of the Wand of Orcus. I'm sorry, the Wand of Baloth. Absolutely. And just as a note, you know, on D&D Beyond, you can just go in and change that name. That's uh, you can customize that thing uh, at any time. That's true. I should. <laughs> I should. Yeah, I think Baloth's torn between the narcissism of calling it the Wand of Baloth and wanting everyone to know, like, no, no, this is the Wand of Orcus. I have the Wand of Orcus. Uh, so, yeah, so that's that's a bit of a conflict for him. There's other things on there. Uh, Baba Yaga's Mortar and Pestle. Uh, that was actually given to me as a gift by the viewers of the show. They uh, they decided that that would be uh, that was there was some in game voting and uh, Baloth was awarded Baba Yaga's mortar mortar and pestle by B Dave and I kind of assumed that because it was just essentially given to me by the viewers that I would have to surrender it. But B Dave said, "No, no, no, you you hold on to that." So so there you go. He's got a couple of artifacts uh, that he's packed so in there. This one has uh, random properties, two minor beneficial ones, a major beneficial one, and a minor detrimental one uh, that go mm -hmm. with it. Is there anything that stands out from your uh, experience with the Mortar and Pestle? Uh, the Mortar and Pestle, let me just, because uh, I think I actually have listed, it won't be there on the sheet because it's all, uh, it was all random stuff, but... We can look up. Uh, you I, can believe the, I believe the Mortar and Pestle... Kills plants. I do know that uh, the Wand of Orcus, it's one of them. 
essentially destroys all holy water within a certain radius. So if you're in a party with Baloth at this particular build and this particular arrangement with this inventory, uh, keep any priests, any clerics, any paladins, you probably want to stay away from Baloth. There also is, I believe, uh, a detrimental effect. Oh, yes. Uh, anything that... I think this is from the Wand of Orcas. Anything with a challenge rating of uh, zero or lower that comes... So, like, plants or helpless animals or things like that, they just die with if they get within a certain radius of Baloth. So he has this moving circle. It doesn't actually really help in combat, because anything with a challenge rating is immune to it. But certainly, yeah, any plants, any uh, any small rodents, uh, probably want to keep kids away. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I don't think it actually affects Baloth that much in his day to day, but uh, you know, you might want to keep that in mind if you're if you're around him while he's carrying these artifacts. <laughs> oh, and uh, another uh, change that ad which we saw in the art for the most recent Idle Champions uh, Shadowfell game, uh, while possessing the wand of Baloth, or sorry, the wand of Orcus, uh, Baloth. It appears half skeletal, so it's the right half of his body is completely stripped of flesh, and he's a skeleton. Though I think we established that it's just that his flesh is rendered invisible, because he can still feel his face, and he can still talk with half a tongue. Incredible. I feel like the intimidation mm -hmm. check probably went uh, a little bit up <laughs> with would the, hope. that would edition. Hope. Um, what would be your advice for someone who is playing a super high-level sorcerer for the first time? Well, you're going to want to keep track of, I mean, at that level, you have a lot of sorcery points to, to spend, but they still deplete, uh, as I discovered. Uh, <laughs> just throwing sorcery around and metamagic and then just realizing, ah, oh, geez, I don't have enough to do anything. Uh, <laughs> but of course, at this particular level, uh, you have sorceress recovery, which is very handy for getting uh, the metamagic points back. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I think it is just with a short rest you get a bunch of sorcery points back. Yes, your your yeah. short rest is going to come into play, and you've also got uh, the you've picked up the level twenty sorcerer thing. Uh, uh, yes, yes, sorcerer restoration. Short rest. <laughs> mm -hmm. And normally sorcery <laughs> points only come back on a long rest, so sorcery points are yeah that that helps a lot. Because you can, of now, course, use consider... those sorcery points to... Oh, sorry, to... Oh, uh, use those sorcery points to buy back spell levels, uh, to perform metamagic, to do things like summon your Hound of Ill, uh, Ill Omen, or at this level, enter your Umbral form, which is very handy for a sorcerer, especially when you're getting low on the hit points. Uh, that gives you resistance to all forms of damage and lets you walk through walls and things like that. Of course, the usual things come into play. If you end your uh, turn inside a solid object, you'll take some damage. Uh, and I believe psychic and force damage still affect. Um, now, so you made good use of the level 20 uh, feature for getting some sorcery points back on a short rest, but did you ever consider multi-classing Baloth by the time he hit 20, or did it make the most sense to stick with sorcerer? I had thought about getting some levels of bard. Uh, just to really sort of amp up and give him maybe like the ability to buff uh, teammates and things like that. But, you know, he's a sort of eggs all in one basket sort of guy. And given I, th I thought, yeah, the high performance skill is enough to convey that part. And beyond that, it's like, I don't know if Baloth is really generous enough to be like, I'm going to spend my turn helping you. It's like, mm, yeah, he'd probably be more interested in uh, in just throwing a fireball. Or or something to that effect, or a meteor swarm. Probably, <laughs> let's face it, meteor swarm. Um, are there any tactical things for like how do you have a sort of a go to? All right, with this type of combat situation, here's my go to damage versus, uh, you know, when is the right time for a meteor swarm as opposed to a chain lightning? Uh, I think obviously you're trying to take because he doesn't have the ability to say sculpt spells. Uh, unless you want to destroy your whole party and, and make things easy for the opposition, maybe maybe wait until they're clear to cast that uh, meteor swarm. It's got a fairly wide radius of effect. Um, I think that for the most part, uh, as I mentioned, at lower levels, Marmadark is key to any strategy. 
because you want to get him in there. Not only is he giving disadvantage to your foes when you're casting spells on them, but he's also dishing out damage on his own. Uh, less so at these levels because, again, most things that you're going up against could probably take him out immediately with one hit, and then that, that and, you know, and also you don't want to put Marmadark in danger at this. I've noticed this actually with most, unless you have like an animal companion that really scales up in power with you and things like that. Uh, at a certain level, all player characters are become more about, okay, well, now I've got to take my familiar or my animal companion. I'm going to put them here where they're safe and they'll be good away from everything. And uh, yeah, less about them charging up on the front lines. Totally makes sense. All right. Final advice for, for folks who might want to craft a character or or what makes Bailoff fun to play, both mechanically and in terms of character? Well, Bailoff himself would say that as uh, spellcasters go, sorcerers are the fun ones because they don't have to deal with all that book learning. Uh, of course, you will have to deal some do with some book learning, just reading up on the rules and how meta magic and stuff like that works. But if you want a character who is essentially working on inspiration and getting by on talent as opposed to hard, studious study of magical spells, that yes, the sorcerer is for you. Uh, and like a wizard, they can tap into vast destructive power of spells and achieve um, uh, amazing effects, but uh, they are a little more free-spirited, shall we say. And often I've noticed that sorcerers tend, not necessarily a hard and fast rule, but tend towards chaotic and Baylot certainly epitomizes that. So if that sounds like a good time, you should click on the link going through the chat right now or down in the description to take a closer look at level 20 Baylot Baratil, uh, who is a delight both to talk about and to see in action across the various ways that you have brought him to life. Um, so thank you so much, Mark. Where can people find you for more of your adventures? Well, uh, you can watch the official Dungeons and Dragons Twitch and YouTube channels every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific, at 7 p.m. Eastern for the Black Dice Society, uh, which is a fantastic Ravenloft campaign. Again, DM'd by Mr. B. Dave Walters. We have amazing folks on that. That is myself, uh, Nora Ibrahim, uh, Tanya DePass, DJ Knight, uh, Sage Ryan, Becca Scott, and, and of course, B. Dave, with fantastic guests like V. Muse and... Most recently, uh, Mr. Jason Carl as a certain Strad von Zarevich. Mm -hmm. Doesn't get much better than that. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's one of my favorite campaigns ever. So you can see that on Thursdays. You can also, speaking of vampires, catch me on Stitch of Fate, a podcast by night. Uh, that is just wrapped up. It's second season. And you can find that wherever you find your podcast. That's a vampire, the masquerade, actual play. And, uh, oh, D, D in a castle. I just got back from the UK uh, earlier this month and or earlier last month because we're in May now. But I got back uh, from D, &D in a castle. Uh, it was so great to be back there after a couple of years of enforced absence. And now we are doing live games at the castle again. We've got sessions coming up in September and October uh, with a fantastic range of uh, range of dungeon masters and also me. I'm also there. Now, of course, we are going to stay tuned, uh, take some of your questions and chat a little bit more because uh, Mark is one of the most fun people to talk to about the love of Dungeons and Dragons and watching that grow over time. But that is going to wrap it up for our character sheet tour for Bayloth. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, stay tuned. Our Nether Deep campaign is back tomorrow. We have lots more good stuff coming down the, type, down the pipe. Jasper's Game Week is coming up. And until then, we will Ooh. see you next time on DD Beyond. <laughs>